Okay, that's official. So, uh, um, hello everybody and welcome to our fourth seminar of the, um, the new term, uh, the not so new term now. Uh, I'm Ross King. I teach in the Department of Asian Studies at UBC, but also serve as director of the Center for Korean Research. So thank you all for coming today. And I wanna start um, by acknowledging that the Center for Korean Research and the Institute for Asian Research that houses it are located on the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam people. And as we always do, I also want to make a couple announcements about upcoming talks. So the next one is three weeks from today, which would be March 19, Friday, and that's Emmanuel Kim from George Washington University. Who, is, who works on North Korean literature. And he, his talk is, is titled, A Good Wife is Hard to Find, Shifts in the Representation of Women in North Korean Literature. And then um, about three weeks after that, on April 8th, which is a Thursday, not a Friday, Cedarbao um, Seiji will be giving a talk um, about youthful, from youthful idols to elderly treasures, an examination of performers as cultural ambassadors of the nation. So today's uh, talk is the second in a series of two talks this month uh, that deal with apparel or costume. And we're featuring Dr. Minji Kim, um, who is an independent scholar based in the San Francisco Bay Area. Some of you might have attended her talk back in October, I think it was, at the Korea Society. I think she was speaking about trefoil in early Korean metalwork. Um, but anyway, Dr. Kim is a, is a, a costume historian and, a, and a, a scholar of Korean dress and its history. And she has all uh, three of her degrees uh, from Seoul National University. She got her PhD in 2000 uh, in what I understand is the, the only de such department in all of Korea of clothing and textiles. And um, defended a PhD uh, dissertation on the dress history of Padhe, of the Padhe Kingdom, which uh, is a very unusual and rare topic. And she has also um, done research on and curated uh, the productions of period costumes for Koguryo and Padhe for um, exhibitions at places like the Seoul National University Museum, the War Memorial Museum, the National Folk Museum in South Korea, she does research on cross-cultural influences in East Asian fashion history, on issues of collective identity formation and uh, represent their, the, its representation in dress, uh, dress historiography, um, methodology of fashion history. And uh, I understand that there's a book um, in process, if not in press, uh, perhaps, um, supposed to appear in 2021 uh, that she's co-editing on Korean dress history critical perspectives on primary sources. Um, and today, uh, the title of her talk is Dress and Fashion History of Korea as a Field of Study. So um, Dr. Kim, welcome. Thank you very much for uh, giving us uh, time today. And the floor is yours. And as I was mentioning to Dr. Kim before, we'll um, Go for about 45, uh, 50 minutes. Um, and then um, if you would please um, post your questions into chat, and then I will relay those uh, to Dr. Kim at the end. And, and you can po post those in there anytime, but we won't, you know, sort of address them until um, she has concluded her presentation. So again, thank you, uh, Dr. Kim, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the introduction, Professor King. And thank you all for joining me this evening or morning in Korea wherever you are. Uh, let me share my screen first. Is it showing now? Okay. Before I begin, I wanna express my gratitude for this opportunity to speak for the audience of Center for Korean Research at the University of British Columbia. First of all, um, 
I want to thank Professor Millie Creighton at the Department of Anthropology for connecting me with the center. And I am very grateful to Professor King for holding the two events in February on dress related topic, which would contribute to broadening the scope of studies on Korea as well as dress and fashion. Thank you, Yeonju Kim, for your logistic assistance. Thank you. And I'm delighted to feature this work, Jang Ot, for the event poster from the collection of Museum of Anthropology at UBC by the artist Kung Gi Suk, based in South Korea, who was a former professor at Hongik University, Korean dress historian, designer, and costume director of 2018 Winter Olympic held at Pyeongchang in South Korea. I will talk more about this work at the end of my talk. I made today's talk targeting Korean studies audience who studies Korea outside of Korea in global academia, aiming to introduce my field of study, dress and fashion history of Korea as a tool to understand past and present society of Korea because I strongly feel the interests in Korean fashion in global academia and museums are growing. So I presuppose if we talk about Korean dress history in the global dress history discourse, and if we want to bring Korean fashion to museums in global venues, then what cultural narratives of Korean dress and fashion can be selected and created to engage with and enrich the global dress and fashion dialogues. To do that, we need to know what's going on in dress and fashion studies and museum field and how other dress history has been discussed and represented in the museums. And we need to attune the view on Korean dress and fashion from a global perspective. Despite the growing interests in Korean fashion, currently this field has very few researchers and no home institution to foster scholarship. So my talk today will be very preliminary and formative stage of discussion in that regard. I will begin uh, this talk uh, addressing globally increasing visibility of Korean dress and fashion and reflect recent scholarship on dress and fashion in both academia and museums in the West. And I will talk about the academic growth of dress and fashion field and diversity and inclusivity issue and definition of dress and fashion. This will be helpful to determine what to research. And I'll talk about prevalent Eurocentric perceptions of fashion. Then I will elaborate a bit further on why studies on dress and fashion history of Korea outside of Korea are needed and conclude calling for the audience's attention to this field for their future researches on Korea. As just introduced by Professor King, I finished all my studies in South Korea and moved to the United States. When I left my country 20 years ago, less and less people were wearing hanbok even for ceremonial occasions. And the studies on hanbok in the academia in Korea began to severely decline. So back then, I thought if I moved to the United States, my career as a Korean dress historian would be over. At that point, I never imagined there would be a demand to learn about Korean dress in Western academia. But the two decades in the 21st century saw South Korea's rising presence in global arena, brought by the country's geopolitical importance, incredible economic growth, and most importantly and recently, cultural ascendancy. And on the other hand, the recent decades also saw shifting paradigm around dress and fashion scholarship in the West. The major transitions include dress history that has that once regarded as trivialized field of study has gained recognition as well established subjects of academic study. And 
rise of fashion studies and fashion museology and the movement to decolonize fashion system and to decentralize Eurocentrism embedded in dress and fashion history and to raise diversity and inclusivity within the discipline. So these are the recent trends in dress and fashion scholarship in the West. And in South Korea, although studies on traditional Korean dress in the universities has been declining, during these two decades, South Korean fashion has experienced a craze for cutting edge style hanbok among the young generation. A profusion of creative innovations in hanbok design and styling, melded with global inspiration and historicism, burst at the seams and expanded the spectrum of hanbok with the newly coined terms, fashion hanbok, fusion hanbok, new hanbok, shin hanbok, and reformed hanbok, geryang hanbok, lifestyle hanbok, sengwal hanbok. So because of this disruption, what we conventionally called hanbok was redefined as traditional hanbok, jeontong hanbok. That means these hanboks are not traditional. Only traditional hanbok is traditional. But the quote unquote traditional hanbok is also under constant transformation. This phenomenon really questions us, what is tradition? If a tradition is being constantly transformed and invented and reinvented, and then is that tradition or innovation? And hanbok is traditional dress, Korea's traditional dress. But if that phenomenon continues, does hanbok embody tradition or modernity? Why dress keeps on changing? And what does the change mean to people? So this just uh, makes us keep thinking about what is tradition. And the trend, this trend was boosted by cultural tourism internalizing in the country. And the trendy hanbok was increasingly adopted as K performers costume, which has had enormous influence on their followers. In this trend, the needs to learn about hanbok in South Korea has newly emerged from the business side, which includes current and prospective small scale hanbok business owners and recently the education is rather being implemented by a government institution, Hanbok Advancement Center established in 2014 to promote and reclaim the unique identity of South Korean national dress as one of the core elements of traditional culture. The heightened visibility of K-style, K-fashion, K-beauty, and dress practice has been inducing a fantasy of things Korean and Korean TV shows became target sites for marketing strategy through which global luxury brands reach consumers. Now I'm gonna talk about uh, dress and fashion studies uh, in Western academia. Dress and fashion has been studied in earnest since 19th centuries. However, up until the 1990s, the studies had often been mentioned about its trivialized status. It's only during the recent three decades that the field has been recognized as well-established subjects of academic study. Lowe Taylor, who laid methodological groundworks for dress history stated, quote, our field has broken its banks and flooded into a fertile plain of new approaches and methodologies, end quote. And Nicholas and Pollen in their 2015 publication, while celebrating dress history in coming of age, yet pointed out, quote, there remains, however, much to be done, particularly in the investigation of the dress of those who have been marginalized due to ethnicity, geography, gender, or social position, or simply because they did not or do not fit neatly into pre-existing categories. 
Dress is a fundamental means, indeed sometimes one of the only available ways by which groups and individuals express and negotiate their identities, end quote. And also dress history field has long been full of tension and strain between opposing camps, these two opposing camps, which is described as great divide, quote unquote, div great divide by dress historian Low Taylor. The object-based study had been conducted by museum curators who examined the dress as part of material culture, focusing on detailed style and manufacturing minutiae, whereas the theory-based study scholars focused on cultural meanings and social life of dress. But Taylor, uh, in her later writing in 2013, stated that the, the old divide have collapsed as museum curators and theorists work together to investigate problems in fashion history. In South Korea, students learn Korean dress history and Western dress history in a separate course. I would describe this as a great divide in the education of dress history in South Korea. A good thing is that they learn both and Korean dress history is an independent subject. A downside of it is that in this divisive demarcation, the historical development of Korean dress is less likely viewed from a macro level of global fashion history or human history, especially for the view of the sartorial practice in the late 20th century onward, that has shown dissolution of the boundaries between traditional dress and Western dress. As you see, this hanbok, jogori, was made using Western tailoring technique. The shoulder line is slanted. Usually the hanbok construction, the uh, shoulder line is uh, the horizontal, but the shoulder line is slanted here and the armhole is curved and the satin sleeve, which came from the Western jacket tailoring technique is incorporated in the construction of this hanbok jogori. So in real sartorial practice, the boundary between traditional clothing and Western clothing has been already blurred. And this lifestyle hanbok, new hanbok, fashion hanbok, fusion hanbok, those hanboks are not, those hanboks are neither traditional clothing nor Western clothing. Those are in-between spaces that shows intersectionality. Now the, uh, now, uh, the definition of dress and fashion. Um, I talked about dress and fashion history and what is the difference between dress and fashion? In order to create dress and fashion studies as a discipline in Western academia, the terms needed to be defined because the definition of terms affect the, the approach to whole subdiscipline. The definition of dress is much more inclusive than that of clothing or garment. Dress encompasses both body modifications such as tattoo and scarification and body supplements, everything worn over the body from head to toe. And the role of dress was um, the dress have served as a nonverbal sign through which society members constructed and articulated their identities and communicated in their social milieu. A tricky term is costume. Dress and costume are often confusingly used. The two terms were synonymous in the 19th century, but in the 20th century onwards, costume has been commonly applied to dress worn for performance or specific events as opposed to everyday practice, like in Halloween costume and theatrical costume. Costume also refers historic dress. In that sense, many scholars have denoted the term costume history is old school and misleading if meant to be an evolution of daily wears since the term costume itself is changing. So rather than costume history, dress history or fashion history became a much preferred term. With that said, Korean dress history is much more desirable term than Korean costume history.
as it concerns with the development of everyday dress. As dress is an inclusive term, this magnificent gold belt is, is not a clothing, but uh, this is surely an item of dress through which the wearer signaled his or her status to the society members. Even a sword or dagger can be examined as an item of dress because these were carried with the wearer's body as an important element that constituted one's appearance through which a wearer's identity was displayed. Therefore, the iconic motifs in pommel design of sword are considered significant in, this, in dress study in terms of this is a, an indication of wearer's status. And the trefoil motif was as meaningful as dragon and phoenix motifs, dragon and phoenix motifs, as an indicator of one's status or identity. Since the definition of dress encompasses body modi modifications like a tattoo or skin scarification, the meaning of makeup or a hairstyle can be a subject of research in dress study as a nonverbal communication tool. The definition of fashion is far more complex than that of dress or costume. And the definition of fashion is still being in rigorous examinations. Dress is a material culture, but fashion is related to both material culture and non-material culture. Fashion can refer material culture that involves change over time. Also, fashion is considered as a non-material culture of social phenomenon and social process by which a certain social or cultural form is diffused into the society. And the definitions of fashion vary depending on scholars and yet no consensus on what fashion is what fashion is exactly. However, Janssen and Craig in their 2016 publication uh, state, fashion's characteristics in general uh, are its ephemerality and its rapid and in incessant stylistic changes. So fashion should be involved with change over time. Not every clothing or dress can be a fashion. Also, fashion has long been used to support these binary narratives of Western modernity. So fashion has been equated with Western modernity, progress, civilization, and capitalism. Vis-a-vis -vis the Orientalist view on dress culture in other places as an unchanging and traditional other that lacks of fashion, non-fashion. This conventional dichotomous notion accorded the dress of Western civilization a superior and special position. Also, fashion has long been believed that, quote, fashion is exclusive to the West. Fashion appeared in the West first in the mid 14th century, quote. However, this long believed tacit belief has been seriously contested in recent scholarship, which has consequently stimulated research on non-Western dress and fashion. One of the publications in that regard is by Welters and Lilithan, Fashion History, A Global View. And the, this book presents a range of examples across time and space to disprove this belief and the authors argue fashion existed in Europe pr prior to the medieval period and in cultures outside the West. And the authors uh, attempt to reconceptualize fashion as a phenomenon that occurred historically around the world. The trickle down theory is a dominant theory in Western fashion history that explains fashion change as emulation of elites. However, the authors argue that emulation of elites is not restricted to the West. In fact, it is a common theme across fashion history. And conclude the book with a call, quote, to scholars around the globe to assess new evidence 
and reinterpret already available evidence, including artifacts in museums, toward writing new fashion histories in light of the reconceptualization of concepts presented here. Scholars must overcome disciplinary boundary, boundaries by collaborating with colleagues to amplify the fashion history knowledge base with exemplars beyond the West. Dress history scholars should learn the language of their targeted society and work with others to reach the depth needed. Each study, no matter how small, will contribute to a truly gl global history of fashion, end quote. This message urges research on fashion exemplars in Korea. So responding to this call today, I bring lights on the earliest textual description that can be ascribable to fashion phenomena that occurred in Korea, sourced from San Guajir, Records of the Three Kingdoms, Volume Book of Way, Section Eastern Barbarians. The title in Korean is Samgukji Wijidong Ijeon, compiled by Chinese historian Chen Shou in the late third century. The reason I brought this rec this, that record is that I believe that is the, the earliest exemplars, but more fashion cases are found in Korean history. So that record, uh, the historical background for that record, uh, I'm gonna talk about a little bit of uh, the history during this time. So during this time in the territory of Korea and Manchuria, several <clears throat> tribal confederacies, which did not yet develop into state level, coexisted with four Han commanderies. So Goguryeo and three Han confederacies are Korean tribal confederacies. And here, Xuantu and Lulang and Taifang are the Han commanderies. Um, the administrative districts controlled by Han China. At this time in China, uh, the dynasty was Han dynasty. The record reveals the tributary visits from Goguryeo to Xuantu and the three Han confederacies to Lulang and Taifang and the receipt of Chinese formal ensembles of clothing and headdress along with Chinese official titles. So this record reports, Goguryeo leaders yearly visits to Xuantu, the Han commandery to receive Chinese formal ensembles. So here every year Goguryeo people came and took the ensembles. And, that, and this record, another record reports the craze for Chinese formal ensemble by the people of three Han confederacies, even when ordinary people from three Han confederacies visit Nangnang and Debang, Lulang and Taifang, they borrow Chinese formal ensembles there and wore them to pay tribute to the chieftains in the Han commandery. It was over a thousand people who wore their own identity seal, Insu, bestowed by the Debang chieftain and Chinese formal ensemble of clothing and headdress. So this record um, reports the craze for Chinese formal ensemble. When the Chinese character 8,000 is used to describe something that doesn't mean numerical information. This means significantly large numbers of people. So um, of course, this record should be considered as written from the vantage point of Chinese historian. But if we read between the lines, the record alludes human desire, eager to flaunt their power through dress and fashion as an act of imitation and the use of Chinese formal, formal dress as a source of authority for Korean leaders. So I argue that the transmission of dress through tributary activities needs to be in, investigated in light of fashion system that sets fashion capital and peripheries. Through these kind of institutionalized tributary activities, a transnational fashion system has burgeoned in the ancient East Asia, and the system forged into forming a sartorial cultural zone, Pan-Asian sartorial cultural zone in pre-modern Asia, where 
issuing state dress code had been an important political realm. Within this transnational dynamics of the fashions, each country also maintained their indigenous sartorial aesthetics and their dress practice. And moving on to the rise of fashion museology, um, museums that conventionally displayed paintings and sculptures suddenly got an interest in fashion as a subject for display. Museums became important site for fashion and the presence of fashion in museums seemed to be omnipresent, not only in uh, world-class museums, but also in university museums and local historical societies. And fashion exhibitions held at metropolitan cities set records of the most visited, um, most visited exhibitions. And Crowley and Barbieri, Barbieri explained the reason Quote, the, the appeal of fashion is far more universal than that of other objects. And we all dress every day. Dress is very familiar and intimate medium through which a wide range of visitors engage in learning. So the editor of this book, uh, Fashion and Museums, Theory and Practice, addresses that the transition of museum practice into fashion museology is to, to attract young visitors. Museums strive to raise its visibility through staging of spectacular shows and fashion events. Fashion exhibition does not only display fashionable clothing, but quote, image-based analysis of fashion phenomena built on spectacular scenography that visually illustrate analytical narratives, end quote. So with this rise of fashion in museums, several Korean fashion exhibitions were celebrated in the globally renowned museums. The first significant exhibition was Korea Now, held at Les Arts Décoratifs in Paris in 2015 and 16. Um, and this exhibition, when I visited this exhibition, I frequently encountered Parisians sitting down in the gallery and sketching the displayed objects, which I didn't see much in American museums. And the second exhibition was uh, Couture Korea, held at the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco in 2017 and 18. This exhibition illuminated Korean fashion with four four categories. The first gallery displayed recreated historical garments based on dress artifacts and genre paintings. And the second part was the works of contemporary South Korean designer Jin Tae-ok. And the third part was the, the uh, odd couture interpretation of Korean aesthetic by the late Karl Lagerfeld from Chanel 2016 Cruise Collection. And the final gallery was dedicated to the works by two Korean junior designers, Im Son Ok and Jung Mi Son. And another exhibition on Korean exhibition was supposed to open last year. Korean fashion from Royal Court to Runway was scheduled to open in August 2020 at the George Washington University Museum and Textile Museum. This one, according to the curator Lee Talbot, this one has been postponed to 2022. So stay tuned for this exhibition. Now, um, why an academic discipline of Korean dress and fashion history outside of Korea is inevitably needed? So, so far I have touched on the request for raising diversity in fashion and dress studies and ensuing Korean fashion exhibitions in global venues. I think the two things already explained the need, the need of the discipline outside of Korea. If I may elaborate a little bit more, since more Korean fashion exhibitions are anticipated to be held, I think those future exhibitions should transcend mere introduction of Korean dress to the West. Studies on Korean dress history outside of Korea are expected to offer analytic narratives 
that will fit into global dress history along with other dress histories so that the accounts of Korean fashion can actively engage with global fashion discourses, enrich the dialogues, and help overcome this minor but massive misrepresentations with incorrectly displayed object images in many museums outside of Korea. Korean upper garments are supposed to be tied with left panel over the right. But if you search online collections, you will find many images with the right panel over the left. And this robe is a red dragon robe, Hongnyongpo, like the one on the right uh, from National Palace Museum of Korea. But this was photographed inside out. The red fabric, uh, the yellow fabric is the lining, and the red fabric is the main fabric. So uh, to prevent and um, fix this minor mistake, uh, Korean dress study should be uh, implemented in global academia. And another reason is to bridge the scholarship between Korean native scholars and scholars in global settings and to tune interpretive gaps in the view of traditional dress, such as a point raised by Nancy Mickelwright from Freer and Secular Gallery at Smithsonian Institute. Nancy Mickelwright raised a point at the conference documenting Korean costume, primary sources and new interpretations held, at in, uh, held in 2017. She addressed, quote, I was, I was intrigued by the first sentence of an article on Korean traditional dress saying that the basic styles of hanbok were established in Korea during the first century BCE and have remained essentially unchanged until the present day. This description is then followed by the detailed account of the many changes, end quote. She describes this as the tension between a perceived timelessness and actual significant change. And this tension provokes a sense of pushing back against our understanding of dress and fashion history that actually occurred in the region. I totally agree on this point. And this book, Hanbok, was published by Korea Foundation. Its subtitle, Timeless Fashion Tradition in the Same Vein, underscores long endured cultural life of the national dress. However, the timeless and fashion contradicts, as I explained, fashion is to change. Fashion implies change over time. And Korean dress history did undergo major and minor fashion changes. In South Korea, dress history has been researched in earnest since 1960s, and considerable progress has been made over the past 60 to 70 years. The most dramatic contribu contribution to the researches was made by a wealth of garments from tomb excavations across the entire territory of South Korea, datable from the 16th to 19th centuries. Tomb owners are identifiable through the ancestry records, Jokbo. Most of the tombs belong to royal family or gentry families. The unique burial practice, lime soil mixture burial tomb, Huegwangmyo, this style of uh, burial practice was prescribed by Neo Confucianism. When the mortar met with water for the first time, the mortar got solidified and that completely sealed the coffin, blocking penetration of air, water, and bacteria which mummified the body and enabled preservation of shrouds for hundreds of years. It is not uncommon to find 70 to 80 garments in a coffin. Packing the coffin with many articles of clothing was the filial duty to children uh, of children to their parents. The first discovery of excavated dress was made 
was reported in 1941. Since then, more than 5,500 garments have been retrieved and documented in the course of the highway construction, land development projects, and tomb relocations by the descendants. So Danguk University Museum, Chungbuk University Museum, Andong University Museum, Gyeonggi Province Museum, those museums are known for excavated garments collections. And some of select excavated garments had been traveled for exhibitions in the United States. The Getty Museum's Looking East, Rubens' Encounter with Asia, uh, some of the um, excavated garments were exhibited and also uh, treasures from Korea Arts and Culture of the Joseon Dynasty exhibition held at Philadelphia Museum of Art and uh, that uh, also traveled to Los Angeles County Museum of Art. So, um, and lastly, I wanted to include one, at least one object from the collection of the Museum of Anthropology in the University of British Columbia. Um, and I chose this artware. You can notice this is not, an, not a garment. If I enlarge this, the image, uh, you can see this was not made with fabric. This, way, this was made with wire and beads. And this is an artware. And the definition of artware by Melissa Leventon, who held a, an exhibition on artware in 2005 at the Young Museum, she defines artware as a handcrafted clothing made by artists rather than fashion designers. And from their own handmade textiles using techniques common in fine art, crafts, and fashion. The genre of artware emerged in 1960s in the United States. In Korea, the first exhibition on artware appeared in 1987. So the artist Kim gi -suk began to create artware at the onset of the genre in Korea, and the Museum of Anthropology houses two of her works inspired by surviving Korean historical garments. And the inspiration of this work is Changot or Changui. Changot is a type of coat worn by both men and women in the whole 500 years of Joseon Dynasty. So this one is a coat worn by both men and women. However, women's wearing Changot had been in constant political discussions. In 1456, a civil official, Yang Sangji, made a plea to King Sejo for prohibition of women's wearing of Changot. The first reason was the very weird way of wearing it. The Joseon Wangzhou Shilok, Annals of the Joseon Dynasty, has a record, quote, Joseon women wore Changui between Jogori and Chima, forming the three layers. I can't even imagine how a coat can be worn between jacket and skirt. How, however, but um, this style of wearing it was emulated by the women in the whole country. This must have been really serious problem. So um, here we can also see the fashion phenomenon that occurred in Joseon, Korea. And another reason was another reason to ban women's wearing of Changot was women's wearing menswear. So in light of neo-confucian notion of proprieties, men and women should be differentiated. So men and women should be differentiated. But this Changot was an androgynous item. So Changot was socially considered as a bizarre or flirty look, bogyo. Historically, when a fashion reached its zenith, people usually don't observe the law. So fashion wins over uh, law. So Joseon women continue to wear 
Zhangho despite the banning and the debate continued at the court until 19th centuries. In the later period, the way of wearing Zhangho for women, however, has transitioned from a coat to a veil, worn over the head to cover their face in public place. Thanks to the artist's 21st century artwear, today I was able to illuminate the hidden fashion history in Joseon, and hopefully I could uh, illustrate how dress can be employed as a powerful tool to illuminate the society. And when the artist undertook the costume design for 2018 Olympic opening ceremony, the works were again recorded, uh, recreated as wearable costumes for the picket girls, dubbed as the snow fairies. Preparing this talk, I had a privilege to interview the artist through a chatting app, and I appreciate she provided these images uh, to share with the audience. Regarding the 88 styles she had designed for the Olympic opening show, she recalled, quote, while I utmost try to embody the Olympic spirits, I grappled with drawing on what genuine Korean aesthetic is. In modernizing the tradition, it is important to bring the essence of Korean characteristics into works that would be universally appealing. What I was especially cautious was to make my works distinctively Korean, not to be likened to Chinese or Japanese. Her message clearly portrays that Korean identity construction through dress is persistent to this day contemporary designers. Such an attempt that, uh, such an attempt to manifest group identity or collective identity through dress can be traced back to the aforementioned earliest written source, San Guajir, the uh, volume Book of Way, section Eastern Barbarian, Samgukji Wijidongizan. And that process is still ongoing in the 21st century uh, fashion practice. The East Asian countries, China, Korea, and Japan developed dress culture strongly associated with each other. As I previously mentioned, Pan-Asian sartorial cultural zone, dress history of Korea should be viewed in a larger context of Asia. And again, dress history of Asia should be viewed in a global context. To, wrapping, to wrap up, um, I think I have asserted why and how dress and fashion history of Korea should be studied in global academia. And hopefully I have uh, illustrated the uh, importance of dress and fashion, the, the importance of studying dress and fashion to how dress can be powerfully employed to, uh, in under, to understand the society of the time. And this subject, dress and fashion history of Korea, lies at where studies on Korea, dress and fashion and museum converge all of which are rising in young academic fields. So dress and fashion studies, museum studies, fashion curatorship, and even Korean studies are rising field. So young scholars and young scholars interest, attention and participation are called upon. This subject is also a multifaceted subject that intersects with many areas of Korean studies, like Korean linguistics, literature, philology, economics, politics, art, history, philosophy, anthropology, sociology, psychology, gender studies, and even in engineering, and much more. So hopefully, scholars and students from diverse disciplinary backgrounds could participate in researches in this field. I'll pause here and look forward to question. Thank you for joining me. 
Thank you very much. That was really interesting. Um, there's already um, a question in chat from Millie, our colleague Millie Creighton. So let me um, read that for you while others start formulating um, additional questions. So uh, Millie says, uh, uh, great talk, Minji. Thanks for clarifying the definitions of, of some terms like dress, costume, and fashion. I have a question about the term hanbo, which means Korean dress or Korean traditional clothing. Can this term, it's a two-part question, by the way, this is part one. Can this term be found in historical records? And if so, was the term hanbok in historical records used uh, with the same meaning. If the term is a relatively new one, what contexts did it uh, come out in? Okay, um, actually hanbok is a modern coinage. Hanbok was coined the term at the on, at, at when um, Western dress was introduced to Korea to differentiate their indigenous and uh, their traditional clothing to uh, from western clothing so the term hanbok emerged in modern times i i i guess it's uh, at the at the turn of the 20th century about that time and Actually, we are using hanbok and Korean dress synonymously. Currently, those two terms are used synonymously. But if we translate Korean dress into reversely into Korean, it can be hanguk bokshik. So the difference between hanbok and hanguk bokshik, I think that can be the temporal boundary. So hanbok can refer when the term was coined and onwards. And Hanguk Bokshi can refer the, from the beginning of Korean history. So uh, that can be a difference. But if we look up to the dictionary, uh, the Korean dictionary says Hanbok is Korean clothing. So because Han means Korean, Bok means dress, a Korean dress. So, but, um, the Korean dictionary says, uh, especially it refers Joseon Dynasty clothing, but I don't agree with that definition. The definition of Hanbok should be defined by dress scholars because from the dress historian's perspective, the style of early Joseon and later Joseon is, is totally different. Uh, the style of ha the style of uh, Joseon dress in early Joseon, and that is a that kind of uh, the um, conspicuous transformation can be um, can be um, recognized uh, at the before the Imjin War and after the Imjin War. Imjin War can be the uh, the the dividing point. And the style of Joseon Hanbok is significantly different from the early period and later period. And if we look up to the dictionary, uh, the encyclopedia of Korean culture, Hanguk Minjok Muna Bekwa Sajan, Debekwa Sajan, that explains Hanbok from the beginning of the Korean history. So um, it can be different, but Hanbok, uh, I would say hanbok at the time the term hanbok was coined already incorporated many foreign elements in the composition of hanbok. Okay, sorry. And by the way, that first question uh, was not from Millie's question. That was from Hyunjung Han. The question from Millie is as follows. Uh, just about that that final image of the blue the blue um, handbook at, at the MOA here at UBC. Yes. She just kind of could it is it really artware? Um, artware is usually described as made of other materials or techniques more commonly associated with art, but still made to be worn. Whereas the blue handbook uh, that you showed um, seems to have been created more as a sculpture in the style of clothing, but with no intent for it to be worn as clothing. And instead to be art, which is different than artware, 
uh, I'm, you know, I guess she's just really wondering if, if that was ever meant to be worn. Um, artwear can be worn or it doesn't have to be worn. So it can be both, but I, it should be, yeah. To be worn, but you, you're in, I had thought that artwear meant it was like art to be worn, but you're saying it goes either way. Yes, but to be an artwear, it has to be made from the textile itself should be made by hand. Handcrafted. Excuse okay, me. Okay, uh, let's uh, see. I'm. Uh, there was a question, or the beginnings of a question from uh, from Young Min Lee. Oh, hang on. Uh, here's one from. I'll come back to that. This is one just popped in uh, from Hyungu, uh, our colleague Hyungu Lin here at UBC. Let me just uh, blow that up. So, sorry, so Dr. Rosking. I yes. think one of the audience, which is uh, who is Chung Che, yes. wants to add something uh, about the question too. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, I want to upload this chatting channel in my question, but it's not function now. Sorry. Oh, I just to speech. Yeah, just use yeah, just say uh, it. Hi, thank you for your wonderful lecture. This is Jiang Choi. Uh, hi, Yao Choi. Yes, professor of Wangang University, Depth of Fashion Design and Opera Industry. Yeah, now and um, I want to know more about the outcomes from the approach of this lecture. Yeah. Research Asian tributely activity through the lens of fashion is very new and fashionable idea. And I want to know more about the outcomes from the approach of this lecture. I heard uh, the tributary activities about, uh, so your question, you want to know more about the, the tributary activities yes. uh, in East Asia? Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, viewing that as a fashion system, oh, that's very. Um, I, I was I was very hesitant if I include that um, record or not. But um, yeah, um, the actually. Um, so when we s examine the court uniforms in East Asia, the similarity in court uniform in China, Korea, Japan, and Vietnam, those countries, East, Asia, East Asian or the Asian countries, court uniforms similarity cannot be explained without investigating the uh, tributary records because when uh, emissaries from periphery countries to pay tribute to the, China, always dress items were bestowed to that envoys. So if we approach that activities from the view of fashion system, then it can be understood uh, kind of um, in different perspective. I, I, I believe it, can, it should be understood from fashion perspective because um, East Asian ancient history is really um, fraught with interpretations on uh, who gave what cultural element, you know? So China gave this element, cultural element to uh, Korea and Japan, and that kind of created, has, had, been, had, had created kind of a cultural originality and sometimes ethnic superiority or racial superiority. So if we approach the, that activities from fashion perspective, it can be more likely viewed like um, um, human elements rather than kind of cultural superior, superiority. So um, I want to approach that from fashion perspective. So fashion existed in every culture. That is kind of a human element that existed throughout history, throughout across time and culture. So 
that's my point. That, that was my point. And mm -hmm. think about our modern fashion history, Paris fashion until 1930s. Paris fashion was a fashion center and fashion capital. And that had enormous impact on American fashion. So I wanted to uh, understand uh, East Asian fashion in, in, in that perspective. Thank you. Okay, let so me go much. back to yeah. this question from, uh, from Hyungu Lin, please. So um, he says, thank you for your talk. You mentioned several dichotomies. So material culture versus theoretical approaches, fashion versus non-fashion, the West versus the rest or the West versus you know, others. And then briefly male versus female. My question is, could you elaborate on recent trends or possibly your views on yet another dichotomy, namely children, children's versus adult clothing, and especially the intersections between age appropriate and morally appropriate clothing? Yes. Um, recently, I see many, many um, divisive boundaries are now dissolving. So uh, I see many approaches in museum practice and academic practice. Um, they want to approach uh, less illuminated field, um, illuminate more kind of hidden field. So uh, in, in that sense, uh, children's culture or children's clothing is being more and more uh, having interest and, and age and even kind of a body, ideal body image. Like um, we all uh, see kind of ideal body type uh, models, but now uh, the body positive movements or something like that. So, so everything which had been hidden is kind of getting spotlight, uh, I guess. And it, it's kind of that kind of movement is emerging. I have a question that's related uh, somewhat to what you were saying just now in response to Professor Choi Jung, um, oh. and which is, I mean, first of all, I guess the the first question is, do Chinese scholars write about Korean dress? Uh, if so, what are they saying? But then it, um, to to the my point is is that you were mentioning that you know we have to somehow. I guess, fight against Eurocentrism in all of this. And of course, everybody in Korean studies gets um, upset with Eurocentrism. But in what I study, which is pre 20th century Korea, the bigger problem is Sinocentrism. And I'm wondering if you if there is a similar issue that's not going addressed in terms of, you know, Sinocentrism, it's all Chinese and whether you're seeing um, assertions to that effect now from Chinese scholars. Yes, uh, Korean dress history, um, if we take a long view, um, Eurocentrism is, I, I, guess, I, I, I guess Eurocentrism is not that a big problem. We have to overcome Sinocentrism in the interpretation of dress history. Uh, Korean dress history. It's much, much um, more overshadowed the development of uh, interpretation of development of Korean dress than Eurocentrism. So, um, but I have not seen any Chinese scholars wrote about um, Korean dress history. I have not seen, if any, please uh, let me know. I would uh, love I mean, to read it. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure and, they. I'm sure there must be somebody. They just have. They're just. You know, there's a lot of scholarship coming out. I'm just curious, but th thank you. That that's kind of real. Yeah, yeah, that's helpful. Yeah. So Korean dress history in establishing Korean dress history, historiography, we have to overcome Sinocentrism and Eurocentrism. And, and if I yeah. I was going to say you because the other the related term you have this you use this very interesting term I think it was pan 
Asian, Asian sartorial, sartorial cultural, cultural zone. zone. Is that your term? Whose term is that? I made it up. <laughs> oh, I like that. Yeah, it, yeah. I mean, that sounds really interesting because it's it's sort of like the the sartorial version of the uh, the 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 hancha munak one, or you know, this Maybe. idea. Of, yeah, I mean, sort of similar cultural sphere, but. That, that sounds uh, like it's worth uh, investigating. But sorry, I, I don't mean to, to, to hog the questions. Are there other questions from the audience? If not, I have one more, <laughs> if I may, um, which is uh, one of the uh, pre-modern Korean works that I read on a regular basis with my students is the Samgang Hengshil Do. Um, the illustrated conduct of the three bonds, and it's an it's one of the rare, you know, pre pre modern Korean illustrated uh, sort of textbooks or you know primers, and it, you know, and most of the people in it are Chinese, the Hyojas and the Yolyas and the Chungshins, and they're all illustrated. But there are also illustrations of Korean Hyojas and Yolyas and and you know these filial sons and loyal wives and so on. I mean, are these a legitimate source for researching dress history in Korea? Have they been exploited, these kinds of illustrated texts? I have not researched on that primary source. So uh, I, I, I can't uh, answer that question. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's worth to investigate how that was described and how it was illustrated. And, and um, but that, I haven't uh, researched. Yeah, okay, that well, story, yeah, I haven't just researched. For, um, for your reference, it's actually, there are yes. Korean scholars claiming that it's one of the world's earliest illustrated children's books. And although whether it's a children's book is debatable, but it's something oh. that has drawn attention from other fields. But I was, wasn't curious, I was curious if, if people in your field had, had looked okay. at it. Um, okay. uh, so the, sorry, and I, 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 let me, Open it up to the floor again. Still have a few minutes, so. And if you know if you're you don't have to be shy. I mean, you can put it. You can just uh, turn on your turn off your you know unmute yourself and uh, ask it uh, just by voice if you'd like. I have a question. Sure, I'm, Kathy. I'm wondering if any of um, in in either the great Japanese Japanese repositories for textiles and or oh. in Tibet given as tribute. Um, as other countries did, are there old, fabulous Korean pieces in either of those places? In Tibet or in Japan? Particularly, yeah. Often they would show up in the repositories in Japan or in the temple, in the temples where they were given as tribute, you know, for starting Buddhism, basically. Um, I don't know about Tibet, but Japanese, yes, definitely. Um, Shosoin, the Dodaiji, uh, is it Dodaiji? Um, mm -hmm. Dodaiji repository. Shosoin has a lot, uh, a, not a lot, but a few um, examples uh, that came from Shilla to uh, Shosoin. And um, uh, F or I, I can't remember the exact name in uh, Japan, but uh, several temples had uh, Korean ancient, the, uh, usually the Samguk, uh, the Three Kingdoms period uh, artifacts are stored. And some has the records that had, that's given from Shilla. So, uh, that uh, is pretty uh, mm, significant. Uh, veritable, yeah, veritable uh, source. Mm -hmm. Would you be interested yeah. in sharing uh, anywhere uh, those images might be um, late afterwards to the 
the people who are listening because it'd be in, it'd be very it'd be very educational and provocative provocative to see some of these images. Oh, my presentation images? No, no, or, or of, the, of, of the pieces that might that you know where they are in Japan. Oh, okay, yes, yes. So, so in yes, yeah, some of the yes, yeah, some of them are researched by Korean scholar, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, yeah. I that's one one of my dream to go to Tokyo, uh, Kyoto, Kyoto and Nara and research. Uh, the Shoso in um, repository artifacts because they stored so many untapped, so uh, uh, intact, intact mm -hmm. condition. So yeah, research should be done first, and then I have to uh, share with other, others. That, that does do cosmetic um, practices count as dress? Yes. The, the definition of dress was made by um, Joanne B. Eicher and Roach Higgins. Um, and that definition is the most popularly used. And Susan B. Kaiser also defined dress as a very uh, inclusive term. Yeah. Well, in that case, uh, as a kind of um, uh, adver advertisement for UBC, I'm putting in chat the uh, a, a, a master's thesis that was defended last year at UBC um, about a literary source from the 18th century, which is all about women's makeup and cosmetic practices. Oh, and okay. you thank might you. Be thank you. And um, here's a, another question. Um, could you please address um, the modernization of Hanbo? There have been some un online shops selling Keryang Hanbok to varying degrees of change from so-called traditional style. And there are also the very practical changes made to Hanbok by those who wear them every day, most especially Buddhist monks and nuns in Korea. The purpose of these two Keryang uh, type Hanbok are very different. One to be trendy, one the opposite. Uh, could you comment on that? Um Yes, uh, so there are many, many shops, online shops, you can uh, purchase Hanbok uh, just online. And um, so the design has no limit, the, the, the transformation or kind of, you can go, the creativity, you can go beyond. So uh, there's no limit and, um, Nowadays, um, actually, um, in the 20th century, Hanbok designers just made Hanbok and they didn't receive uh, university education or kind of special education to make uh, Western clothing. So they just focused on Hanbok design. But nowadays, the, the, the generation changed. So the designers, usually young designers are come from the, the education getting uh, from the university and they learn both Hanbok construction and Western dress construction. Okay. So they can play with any, yeah, every skills. So it, it, it's just, yeah, just intermingles the, the elements in, intermingles in the design. Here's another question. In the context of the rise of the study of material culture, how do you feel about the accessibility of Korean objects for study and research in Korea and outside of Korea? I think um, that is really, um, Korea is pretty open for the use of um, objects for, um, for foreign researchers. So foreign researchers can download the object image for free and they can use it for publication for free. And those objects are also open for the researchers, just in-person visit uh, researchers. So uh, it's pretty 
open and the, the written sources are also open to, uh, for everybody to use. So that would not be that much problem, but you have to visit Korea and the, the objects in housed in America, or I don't know how much was housed in, um, how many objects are housed in Canada, but um, in the United States, um, you, you can just visit museums and research, then uh, museums are usually uh, open to the researchers. So, okay. but not well, many. Got about two minutes. So last, last chance, last call for any last questions from the audience. Going once, I don't see anything coming in the uh, chat. Yes, I am. Is somebody, no? Okay, well then, um, thank you all for coming and uh, thank you, Dr. Kim, for a really fascinating talk. Uh, please don't go away, uh, uh, we'll do some business at the end. But thank you all for coming. And again, join, please join me in thanking uh, Dr. Kim. Thank you very much for joining me today. Very good.